The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to this learning session. I am Nanje Patrick, your physics teacher. Lesson 9, Experimental Physics. We begin the lesson with the correction of the previous assignment or the assignment from the previous lesson. The force F experienced by a straight conductor of length L carrying current I at an angle theta to a magnetic field of field strength B is given by F equal B sine theta. Determine the base units of B. The second part of the assignment, the EMF E produced by a straight conductor of length L moving with velocity V in a uniform magnetic field of strength B is given by E equal PLV. Show that this equation is homogeneous. Now, we have the equation F equal B. We want to determine the units of B. The first thing we do is to make B the subject. Once we make B the subject, we now look for the quantity of the unit of each quantity. What's the first quantity? Force. The unit of force can be obtained from the unit of mass times acceleration. And that the unit of force becomes kilogram meters per second square. The unit of I is the ampere. The unit of L is meter. Sine is a unitless quantity. Sine theta is equal to 1. Therefore, the unit of B becomes kilogram meter per second square divided by ampere times meters. And we have the unit of B to be kilograms, ampere to the minus one, second to the minus two. It is very important to arrange your units from positive powers to negative powers. So I, for example, I cannot say per ampere kilogram, second to the minus two. No, I start with positive powers, kilogram per ampere per second square. The second part was to show that this equation is homogeneous. The right hand side, what was on the right hand side? The EMF. And how do we define EMF from basic electricity? It is a work done per unit charge. What is work done? Work done is force times distance. And charge is current times time. Therefore, the unit of work is equal to kilogram meters per second square. Kilogram meter square per second square. Remember, I have not said that work is equal to that. I say unit of work. So always learn how to write unit of a quantity instead of equating that quantity to a unit. Now that gives me the unit of E to be kilogram meter to the minus two, ampere to the minus one, and second to the minus three. We go to the left hand side. The left hand side, we have B, from the previous assigned uh, A part of this question, we're asked to determine the base unit of B. So I can just bring in the base unit of B from A part, which is kilogram ampere to the minus one, second to the minus two. The unit of V, V was defined or is defined as the speed. So it's meters per second. And the unit of L is the meters. Therefore, the unit of all the quantities on the right hand side or the left hand side, if I multiply all of them, I should have kilo, kilogram meter square ampere to the minus one, 
second to the minus three. What do we see here? The left hand side and the right hand side do have the same unit. So what do we say? Since the unit on the left hand side is equal to the unit on the right hand side, we say the equation is homogeneous. So unit of BLB is equal to that. Unit, since unit of left hand side is equal to the unit of the terms on the right hand side, the equation is homogeneous. We start the lesson with an objective, a prerequisite, then we'll give a real life situation. The learning activities will follow suit, we'll, have exercise, we'll do exercises, and then we'll conclude with an assignment. Objectives. By the end of this lesson, she will to define accuracy, precision, sensitivity, and uncertainty. You will to define the different types of scientific errors, and you will to state some sources of experimental errors and how they can be minimized in the laboratory. Prerequisite for you to better understand this lesson, you will to have a basic knowledge of base units and derived units, base quantities and derived quantities, which were seen in the previous lessons. You want to read different scales. You want to read the scale, the scale on the metal rule, the scale on a thermometer. You want to read different types of scales. Now, as a test for the prerequisite, we look at that scale and say, what are the readings on those scales? Now, what will be the reading on this scale? So we answer these questions. If you look at that scale critically, we'll see that it is between 1 and 0. Therefore, it can never be less than 1. It can never be greater than... Between 1 and 2. It can never be less than 1. It can never be greater than 2. So the value is supposed to be between 1 and 2. How many spacings are between 1 and 2? There are 10 spacings between 1 and 2. Therefore, a space is equal to 0 0.1 of a centimeter. And to work it out, that region will be 1.7 centimeter. That's what we know so far. If we work this one out, that will be exactly 23 millimeters. And this is a speedometer of a car. There are two, one degree in kilometer per hour, one degree in miles per hour. So if you work it out, we have 70 kilometers per hour. This is the basic idea of scale. So by the end, of this lesson, we will act a little bit to list our prerequisite of reading scales that we know so far. Now, a student saw on an exercise book that the length of that book is 24 centimeters, the width is 13 centimeters, and the thickness is 2 centimeters. She was curious and immediately took her ruler and measured the length, width, thickness of the book, and she displayed her result on the table below. Length. 23.9, width 12.8, thickness 1.6. Mm. She was very disappointed with herself for not having the exact values as the book is saying. What can be the problem? That's the problem. So by the end of this lesson, we should want to explain why she did not score exact values as the book said that this length is this, this length is this, this length is this. Accuracy. What is accuracy? Imagine I am playing a simple dart game where I have to use that to target this middle point. I throw four darts. The first time, that's the target. I have to target this point. I throw four darts. The first one lands here. The second one lands here. The third one, yeah. And the fourth one, yeah. I did not touch the target. I will be disappointed with myself that I am not useful. But no, there's something you can get from this uh, experiment. What is it? Even though this person misses the target four times, but he's very, calm, he's very accurate with a particular position, the first white line. He's hitting that first white line all the time. So this person is accurate, even though he did not touch the target. So how do we define accuracy? Accuracy is a closeness of an agreement between a measured value 
and an already accepted value. What does that mean? Take for example, I want to measure the length of a football field. And by standards, a football field should be 100 meters. I take my ruler, I measure it the first time, I have 99. I measure it the second time, I have 98. I measure it the third time, I have 99. I am getting close to that value, but I am not reaching there. So I'm saying that I am accurate because the measurement I'm doing is close to the true value, even though I am not reaching the true value. So we define accuracy as closeness of agreement between a measured value and a true or an accepted value. So even though the person playing this dart did not hit the target, he was true to a particular value. He's constant, he's consistent, he's very close to the right value. So this is what we call high accuracy. Precision. Now, imagine I'm still playing the same that. First target, I hit the jackpot. Second target, third target, fourth target, I am here. I try it the second time. First target, second target, fourth target, I am here. What can you say about my experiment? We say this person is precise. What does that mean? There is no difference between the first target and the second target. The first and the second target, third, fourth, are falling around the same point. Therefore, this person is quite precise. So with this analogy, how do we define precision? Precision is defined as how close two or more instruments or two or more measurements agree with each other. So if I use a scale balance, I measure the mass of fish is 80 grams, I use another scale balance, I should have, for these two instruments to be standards, I should have a value very close to the first one. If not, the measurement is not precise. So precision is how close two or more measurements agree between each other. So the number of significant figures will determine the precision. The more the significant figure, the more precise the instrument. As a simple analogy, we have four diagrams on the board illustrating the relationship between precision and accuracy. Look at this first diagram. The person hits the target. How many times? Five times. Therefore, the person is precise and accurate. So precision, yes. Accuracy, yes. He hits the target five times. The person is precise and accurate. Now, let's go to this one down. Did not hit the target at all, but he hit a particular point five times consistently. How do you call such a person? The person is precise, but not accurate, because he's far from the measured value. But he hits a particular value consistently five times. So this person is precise, yes, accuracy, not at all. The third person hits. Even seven times, but they are all scattered. So it's not precise, but he's accurate. Because you see that the points are equally spaced from the central point. So there's a closeness of agreement between the true value, which is the target, and his values. Therefore, he is accurate, but not precise. And the last person is neither accurate nor precise, because the values are all scattered. You cannot determine which, uh, what he is doing. This idea is very important in practicals, because if you are not accurate, you are not precise, you have very scattered points when plotting graphs, and it will be a problem for you to verify a physical relationship, if it's a straight line or a curve. So we are going to learn some errors or when sources, some errors or some uh, sources of errors that can make our measurements either not accurate or not precision. As a reminder, accuracy is a closeness between a particular measurement and a true measurement. For example, if I, if I measure pi or if I calculate pi and I have 2.1, next time 2.11. 
Next time, 2.13. And close to pi. Pi is 3.14. Next time, 3.1. 3.2. And close to it. So I am very accurate. But if I do the first time, I have 2.1. The second, uh, 3.1. The second time, I have 3.8. Now, I'm not precise. Okay. So now, Precision of measuring instruments. A precise measuring tool is one that can measure values in very small increment. Very small increment. If I measure uh, the first value is one, the second one is, uh, let's say I have 10, 20, 30, 40, what's the increment? 10. That instrument is not precise compared to an instrument that can measure small increment. So the precision of, a, of an instrument is determined by the increment in its measurement. Now, take for example a metal rule. To measure distances, we use three uh, instruments in the laboratory the metal rule, the vernier caliper, and the micrometer screw gauge. Now, the metal rule has an increment of 0.1. Precise, but not compared to the other ones. A vernier caliper has an increment of 0.01 centimeters. And the micrometer school gauge has an increment of 0.01 millimeter, which is an increment of 0.0001 of a centimeter. So by judgment, which one is more precise? It is the micrometer screw gauge. It can measure very small increment. So if you are giving a wire to measure the diameter, what do you use to measure the micrometer screw gauge? Because it is more precise. If you use a metal rule, you will lose precision. And you will not be able to measure correctly. Now, significant figures in measurement. What is the role of significant figures in measurement? Significant figures indicate the precision of, an, of a measuring tool that was used to measure a value. And in order to determine the number of significant figures in a value, we always start with the first measured value at the left hand side and count the number of digits through the last value written on the right. For example, if I do a measurement and I have 36.7 cm, it has three significant digits or significant figures. Now, if I do a measurement, 367.12 millimeters, how many significant figures are here now? Five. So this instrument, this measurement is more precise than the one above. Now, errors and uncertainty. The difference between a measured value or the measured values of quantity and the true values is called an error. So if there's a particular true value that has been established theoretically, and I do my measurement, there will be a slight difference between my measured value and the true existing value. And this difference between my true, my measured value and the true existing value is called error. Now, the amount of uncertainty depends upon the measuring instrument and the skills of the person using the instrument. And by the way, at this level, we can interchange the word error and uncertainty. They can be used interchangeably. So it all depends on who is measuring. So the tools, even though the instrument may have some faults, but also it depends on the skills of the person using the instrument. That is why we are having these lessons, so you develop your skills to use, to use some of these measuring instruments. Not only in the laboratory, in your job site, everywhere you go, you should be able to use these skills to measure in daily life. Now, experimental measurements all have uncertainties. Therefore, the measured value is always written as the best estimate, plus or minus uncertainty. And the uncertainty of any instrument is its precision. Therefore, if I measure something on a digital stopwatch, I should add the uncertainty to it, plus or minus 0.1 seconds. If I measure something on the metal row, I should add the precision to it, which is 0.1 of a centimeter. If I measure anything with a thermometer, I should add the precision to it, which is one degree Celsius. So every measurement has a degree of uncertainty that depends on the instrument and the person using the instrument. So we calculate the relative uncertainty for any measurement as the measured value minus the true value divided by 
the true value. We take the magnitude so that it should not be a negative. Now, combining uncertainties. We can add and subtract uncertainties. Now, when we are adding uncertainties, what do we do? So when we add 3.4 plus or minus, what's the uncertainty? 0 0.2 centimeters plus 2.1 plus or minus, what's the uncertainty? 0 0.1 centimeter. We also add the uncertainties. So if I'm adding an uncertainty of 0 0.2 to an uncertainty of 0 0.1, my uncertainty now becomes 0 0.3. So we, when adding uncertainties, we add their absolute uncertainties. When multiplying and dividing uncertainties, we also multiply, we add their absolute uncertainties. We don't multiply here. So we multiply the numbers differently and we, we add now their uncertainties. Now take for example, 3.4 centimeters plus or minus 5.9% multiplied by 1.5 centimeters plus or minus 4.1%. We multiply 3.4 and 1.5 separately and keep, then we add now the uncertainties. 5.9 plus 4.1 it gives us plus or minus 10% error. Same with division, we add the uncertainties. Now, if we are raising uncertainties to some powers, what do I do? You multiply the relative uncertainty by the number in the power. So if I have 5 squared, 5 plus or minus 5% square. What goes on my value? I take 5, I square it, I have 25, and I multiply that uncertainty by 2, and I have 10. That's what you do when uncertainties are raised to powers. More of this will be seen in the practical lessons. Now, types of errors. There are two main types of errors in the laboratory. You have the random error and the systematic error. Random errors are caused by unknown and unpredictable changes in an environment or in an experiment, either from instrument or the environment. So you cannot predict them. You cannot uh, detect them. They are random and they are unpredictable. And they fluctuate in the measured data due to precision limitation. So it may go up, it may go down. You may measure the error may go up, the error may go down. This is random error. It's difficult to eliminate such errors in the measurement. Now, random errors cause one measurement to differ slightly from the next, hence it affects the precision. So random errors affect precision of the measurement. Examples of random errors include electronic noises caused by electrons in move in a circuit. Uh, when weighing yourself on the scale balance, your position might slightly affect your weight. So that's why when you are doing your, uh, your mass on the spring balance, they tell you to stand straight. But if you bend like this, it may affect your weight. When taking volume, read at an angle, destroys the reading, you should read normally. Now, measuring the sample of a mass on an electronic balance may produce values. Air may be flowing around, may be blowing on an electronic balance. And uh, we have, when you have to determine the speed of sound in air, temperature may be changing rapidly. These are changes in the environment that cannot be predicted. So they are random errors. How do we reduce random errors? We say multiple readings must be taken and average. So it's a precaution. You say several values of the reading was taken and the average value calculated in order to reduce random error. Readings must be estimated when they fall between max. So if I have a reading that falls between 1 and 1.1, I have to look for a way to estimate it in between using precisions. Systematic errors are consistent. There are repeatable errors associated with faulty equipment or a flawed experimental design. Why random error depends on the environment and statistical fluctuation, systematic error depends on faulty equipment. So if you repeat the experiment, you will get the same error because the equipment is faulty. So what do you do? So it affects the accuracy of the instrument. And it's difficult to detect and can be analyzed and cannot be analyzed as scaly because it comes from an instrument error. You cannot analyze it mathematically. So how do you... Uh, some examples of a random error is forgetting that an instrument has a zero mark. You just start using it. An error caused by not setting an instrument properly to zero, like the spring balance, it starts from zero. 
at times may go below zero. You have to set it to zero. So forgetting all of this may make your measurements flawed. Now, not reading the manuscripts at eye level, that is also a systematic error. The value may be consistently be low or high. Measuring length with a metal rule which will give a different result in a cold temperature. Now, what we say, metal, not metal, metal. So that's why most of the times the rulers are plastic so that they don't expand with temperature. Uh, your metal ruler you have in your uh, classes are plastic or wood so that you limit thermal uh, expansion of the metal. So these are some sources of systematic error. Measuring length with a broken ruler is also a source of systematic error. Now, how do we reduce systematic error? So once it's identified by, check the instrument, calibrate it. Calibrate the instrument, check it always. Uh, warming up instruments, it's good before you start practicals, take instruments, dust them, uh, check them, warm some of them, wipe them constantly in the lab to minimize uh, systematic errors. Replace instruments if they are broken. Now as a practical difference, systematic error is caused by a broken instrument, a destroyed instrument, and it causes a limitation in their accuracy. Random error is caused by a limitation in the precision. You cannot distinguish between, uh, if it's fall between 1.1 and 1.2, limitation in the instrument causes random errors. Now, some sources of uh, errors in the laboratory. Incomplete definition. Mm -hmm. so you, you do not define the physical quantity very well, you measure wrongly. Failure to account for a factor. You want to design an experiment, be able to account for all the factors. Temperature, pressure, Humidity account for all of these factors. Environmental factors. You may want to determine a temperature, uh, speed of sound, wind is blowing too loud, or uh, temperature is fluctuating rapidly. You want to account for these errors. Instrument resolution. The null difference method is used to resolve such errors. We have calibration. We have zero offset. These are some sources of uh, errors in the laboratory. And uh, parallax error, which we Say so that how do you eliminate parallax error by uh, placing your eyes normal to the instrument? Now, exercise one how close a measurement is to the true value is called how close a measurement is to the true value is called accuracy. Accuracy is how close a measurement is to the true value. Two, the bull's eye demonstrates. What type of, is it precision, high precision, or high accuracy? Is it low precision or high accuracy? So the bull's eye demonstrates low accuracy, but very high precision. Because the accuracy is low, because it's far from, the elevation is very high. Now, the volume of a liquid is 26 milliliters. A student measures the volume and finds it to be 26.2, 26.1, 25.9, 26.3 in the first three, four, in the first four trials, respectively. Which of the following best describe this measurement? Is it accurate? Is it precise? So, what is the best statement? You see, the student has a good precision because the instrument, the measurements are around. The true value, what is the true value? 26 milliliters. We have 26.2, 26.1, 25.9, 26.3. All these four values are around the true value. Hence, the student has a very good precision. Exercise four. The volume of a liquid is 25.5 milliliters. Which of the following sets of measurements represent the value with good precision, good accuracy? Good accuracy. What do we have? D. What is good accuracy? We have 25.20.2, 20.5, 20.3, 20 20.1. All of them around 20.5. So this is close to the true value. So it's good accuracy. Exercise 6. Which is more precise measurement? D. That's more significant figure. So D is more precise. Now, as you recall, we define precision as the agreement between, the closeness in agreement between two measured values. Closeness in agreement between two measured values.
values. And we define accuracy as the closeness in agreement between a measured value and a true value. That is the difference between precision and accuracy. As an assignment, determine the precision of the following numbers. Assignment number one. Determine the precision of the following numbers. Assignment number two. Determine the accuracy of the following. Determine the accuracy of the following. We have come to the end of this learning session, which was on experimental physics. We'll talk about precision and accuracy. See you in the next learning session, which will be on standard instrument one. Unna tege si ma tege yob, unna tege minga ma tege nyum, unna tege ma jang ma tege ndom, ma ne tambia ninya ne injubia yen, ngani bana ma tege mot, ngani la kiri wa tege ndong, eseti na bia dinki do, ma ne tambia ninya ne injubia yen, tam tam amote tam zabike. Tam tam a tonge tam zabike tam 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 a mote tam zabike mane tam bia ninya ne injo bia yen 